It was very male dominated in those days before the AIDS crisis, which is really the change in terms of um, uh, more gender balance in the movement. Um, it, and you did have a very divert, you had grassroots in downtown or inside and outside. So part of my challenge as, an, as one of the uh, first openly gay um, elected or uh, public officials, openly LGBT public officials, was to bridge those gaps and to get everyone engaged. So even when you were organizing campaigns, when we um, were organizing Initiative 35 to stop um, the repeat, attempted repeal of the sick leave and funeral leave, um, we would not have won that without the business communities, communities of faith, involved in that because it just, it was not um, on anybody's radar screen. The word domestic partner wasn't really in the language then. So going out and trying to explain that this was a personnel benefit to allow you a few days off to, to attend your loved one's funeral was was a challenging uh, thing to organize around. Um, but so the grassroots community, the business community, we had everybody involved, but they were disparate. They weren't, as you said, they were not uh, in, in a tight um, coalition, but that was the beginning of it. So I had, for example, some businesses. We were running the Families and Education Levy that year. It was our first Families and Education Levy, um, and it was on the ballot at the same time. And I was helping organize that as well. And we had businesses who refused to let us phone bank for initiative against Initiative 35, who would let us phone bank for the Families and Education Levy. So it, we, you know, we still had a ways to go then, but we also had business support. So um, winning that, and then we were able in the following year, 1990, to get full domestic partnership benefits passed. So we were among the first cities in the country then to do that after San Francisco and um, a couple other California cities. Following that, we did the Hands Off Washington. Um, we kept successfully the Oregon Citizens Alliance from getting those measures on the ballot through those decline to sign and public education efforts. And then each year there were anti-gay efforts trying to get other things on the ballot because the initiative process here is so easy. Um, so we spent a lot of time just trying to keep bad things from happening. Well, in 2006, Right after we finally got the anti-discrimination law passed after 29 years, people may not remember this, but Tim Iman actually got together with uh, uh, Reverend Hutcherson and some other folks, Stephen Pidgeon, some others that, whose names you might recall, uh, in coalition to try to repeal that. So the governor hadn't even signed it yet. It had taken 29 years, and they started collecting signatures, and Tim Iman led this effort with these socially um, conservative groups. So we created Washington Won't Discriminate, which was a statewide coalition, again, built on all those past efforts uh, to try to keep this off the ballot. And then if it did get on the ballot, to help make sure the law didn't get repealed. Uh, they were engaging in some signature gathering then that was not all above board. And so um, we did a lot of uh, research then and got prepared to challenge it. Should they get enough signatures, we were all ready to go. Uh, Tim Iman lied to the media, and I use that word not advisedly. I mean, he it was, it was a literal um, expression. He uh, did not have enough signatures, but everyone thought he was going to, and because of what he had told this, the groups in his coalition and the media, and they showed up on the Secretary of State steps the day that signatures were due. He wore a gorilla outfit. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah, he, uh, literally, he he wore. A, a, a gorilla costume, brought all of his boxes, uh, uh, and we were ready to challenge the veracity of those, and he barely did not qualify. So we didn't have to. Uh, so we won without having to go to a full vote, and the law was not repealed. The law went into effect, and that was 2006. Then in 2009, after the third of three domestic partnership laws had been passed, uh, a number of the same groups got together to organize again and try to repeal that. So I chaired that effort as well and pulled together a similar coalition. We all still had everybody's phone numbers and we were everybody had been so terrific in coalition. The, um, uh, labor unions, uh, people of faith, the business community, all sorts of progressive civic groups, the League of Women Voters has always been there for us. Um, good government groups, senior groups, family um, groups, communities of color. So it's always been a very strong 
coalition in 2009, um, that was, a, again, um, a number of what one would think of as fraudulent signature gathering efforts were going on. We, and then they got them on film right, in parking lots. Yeah. Right. So we were all ready to go. Um, we had uh, hired pro bono counsel. We had the briefs ready to go. We had our, uh, you may remember this, we went down. We had teams in the Secretary of State's office all summer as the signatures were being counted. And it was sort of like our own Florida hanging chads. Um, so we were there day and night and uh, took issue with a number of signatures that they were accepting. Um, what happened in that instance was that um, we were all ready to go to court and the other side went to federal court to uh, get the court to refuse to release the petitions, arguing that they should be protected um, for their own safety. So here were the anti-gay folks who, in fact, were putting lives at risk of LGBT folks, and they were saying they were concerned for their safety if their signatures were released. Because they said uh, they were getting death threats and everything. Right, yeah. yeah. So uh, the federal judge granted them what was called a temporary restraining order, which meant we couldn't access the petitions to go into court to challenge um, the signatures. That case, we took all the way up through the Ninth Circuit and then the U.S. Supreme Court, where we won. That was called Doe v. Reed. And we won a U.S. Supreme Court decision that uh, said that signatures were public record. And that set the stage for all sorts of other progressive causes to not have to deal with this issue again. I think they refer to it as the Sunshine Law or something like that. Well, Sunshine Laws are the state public disclosure laws. Okay. And in our state, signatures and petitions have always been considered disclosable because it's of value to the public to know who's signing and to be able to check for accuracy. And it's important to the civic debate that that be allowed. Um, and the, uh, even Justice Scalia agreed with us in that. Uh, so we, we won that resoundingly. Um, the other side tried to challenge it again all the way back. So we had to go back through the federal district court. It wasn't until earlier this year. 2013 in January of this year that we finally put that to bed. Wow. So that was a four-year battle. Um, but we went through all of the signature gathering issues there as well. And The um, start of it was just comical. I mean, yeah. it's going through the motions and everything, right. but I remember how dramatic um, Pigeon was where he had the binder and he yes. drops it on the yeah. table of the city yeah. and it's just like, what is going yeah. on? Um, well, and that's a good example of how, um, you know, the legal community was very supportive. Uh, Perkins Coie uh, gave me thousands of pro bono hours to help. We would have never been able to afford. All the money we spent, uh, we would have had to spend on lawyers um, that would not have gone to the campaign. Um, and we won that campaign uh, to keep the domestic partnership law from being repealed. Um, Washington yeah. State became the first state in the country by popular vote to vote in support of LGBT family recognition. Yes, Standing in, in, to get, yes. Yeah. in 2006 I was the chair of Washington Won't Discriminate and then in 2009 Washington Family Standing Together. So um, the uh, country as a whole and the state of Washington were not yet ready for marriage. And when we did our initial polling on that we found that the way in which you asked the question made a big difference. And so um, a lot of people, the, the research at that point was not as nuanced and people weren't as uh, research driven. So a lot of LGBT community folks felt like you've just got to fight for total equality and research be damned. And um, so it was quite a battle to say, no, you've got to win. And we know we deserve full rights, but um, what we need to do is thread this needle to win at this time, given where society was and where the votes were. And there was a great swath of folks who believed in equality, but to them, uh, if there was an alternative, domestic partnerships or civil unions, to them that meant equality. And so they didn't see it as discriminatory and, in fact, didn't intend to be discriminatory. They were good, intent, well-intentioned and good supporters. But marriage was not yet seen in their eyes as the right path. So um, what we allowed them to do, again, the point being when you work on um, ballot measures and community organizing, you need to meet people where they are and respect um, them and their views and try to help educate and share and change hearts and minds. So rather than try to convince them to go from where they were to supporting full marriage, we just needed to get them to support this 
legislation. And then if we could get the statewide vote, and no one had ever done that before at the time, then that would lay the groundwork for if we were challenged on a marriage law, if we got a marriage law through. So um, if we lost that, it would have set back the marriage movement because we would have, people would have said, well, you couldn't even win on domestic partnerships. The legislature never would have passed marriage and the governor wouldn't have supported it. So it was very important that we met people where they were and said, you may not be ready yet to support marriage, but here's an alternative. And um, the legislature's passed this. It's not fair to take it away. It provides very important protections for folks. And if you care about people having um, sick leave, if you care about people being able to take care of their families and visit them in the emergency room, all those sorts of things that people could relate to in their own lives. It also helped us secure the support of the communities of faith, many of which were not ready to support marriage. So, um, Which was different in 74 because they came out right away. Well, and what was very different, so in 71, uh, in uh, referendum 71 in 2006, we had a not only large um, opposition to us by the Catholic Church, but the Mormon Church, very significant opposition, which did not come out in uh, 2012. Um, in fact, they marched in our pride parade. Right. So, so. by the, the difference between 2009 and 2012 was a sea change. You had groups that had, and it wasn't the campaign, and too, much as I and others might like to take credit, in, 2000, in 2006, 2009, and before that, we had to organize the heck out of everybody and get and pull them up, even our own community. You've got to pay attention. You've got to get engaged. But all of the other coalitions we had, by the time 2012 rolled around, people were coming out of the woodwork to be helpful. So Catholics for marriage equality, you had Mormons for marriage equality, you had businesses for marriage equality. We had to organize them, but they were, we want to help. They were, they were there. I mean, there was the, 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 the community of faith march for marriage equality. Yes, which exactly. Like 300 people showed up right, to. Right, right. I mean, that's the difference between 2006, 2009 and... Absolutely. Yeah.